Hello, my name is Daryl Robert Chun. In 2005, a friend of mine from law school, Marshall Thurber, called uh, my wife and I up and invited us to join a group that he was putting together, a group that he called the Positive Deviant Network. And he called it because deviants, he believed positive deviants were those people who might have some insight into answers in times of great change that at the center, at the core of society, when everything is stable, those at the edge and their ideas have no relevance. And if they do, they're such a long way away from being listened to that they won't be listened to. But Marshall felt that in times of great change, the answers are found at the edge. And he knew a lot of people who were different, who, as you would say, marched to the beat of different drummers. And he told Martha and I, since we were the most deviant people he knew, <laughs> he felt that it was incumbent upon him to invite us into this select group of people that he was putting together. And it was what he called, it was a network. Marshall at the time was studying network sciences. And he said it's, uh, he had discovered that um, ideas spread through networks. Not only did ideas spread, but everything spread through networks. Viruses spread. Everything moved out from centers, nodes, connections, 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 connections. So Marshall had the idea that perhaps this positive deviant network of his could be somewhat seminal in discovering new answers to what was going on. Well, I don't think any of us understood what was going to happen, certainly not I. Uh, Martha and I joined, and what that group did was to change my life. Um, in 2007, before this group, we met four times a year. And there were some very extraordinary people in that group. Um, and we came together. And in March 2007, I gave a presentation before this group in Salt Lake City. Well, it was up in uh, Park City, Utah. And on that day, uh, I presented to that group a 148-page white paper on the economy. And the people in this room were very, very, most of them were wealthy. All right? that they had um, uh, uh, a lot of wealth was in that room. Um, they were leaders in their field, all right? And I stood up in front of this group and said that most of them were going to, all of us would be facing tremendously challenging times. That the stock market would fall 70 to 90 percent before this was over. That the real estate values would fall 40 to 70 percent before this was over. And we would encounter times not seen since the Great Depression. Now, when I presented this paper to this group, the stock market was still on its months away from its all-time high of over 14,000. All right? The real estate market was a little unstable, but had certainly not yet begun to crack. If you had a $3 million house, you could probably list it at the right price and get it sold within the next couple of months. And if today you have a $3 million house, I think you know this is quite different. You can't sell it. Not at the price you could have then. And maybe not even at the price that you think today. What I want to say is, I had reached those conclusions after years of study. It wasn't just I didn't get this insight that we were on the verge of trouble and that I wanted to bum out my fellow positive deviants who seem to be floating and doing very well in their life. I didn't want to do that at all. I had been looking at this for at least 10 years. And I, don't, and I know now why I was looking at it. At the time, I wondered. I turned to Martha and I said, why am I thinking about the Great Depression in the 1990s? All of a sudden, these thoughts started coming into me and I started focusing on them in a way I never had before. But what happened is, by the time 2007 came around in March when I made that talk, I was very sure what was going to happen. So sure, I put them down and I made these predictions in front of fellow people who were the leaders of their field, and I felt absolutely sure that they were going to happen. The reaction, I didn't expect. The reaction that day was of outrage, basically, on a lot of those people. They had made fortunes in their respective fields, and here I was, someone with no background in economics, no background in the field of which I was speaking of, finance, making predictions that basically told them that the world was going to change, and deeply so, and they had to better prepare. 
At the time, gold was $675. All right? Silver was far less than what it is today. And I said, if you want to preserve your assets, sell your paper assets, sell your properties, and buy gold and silver. Very few of them took my advice because my advice at that time seemed far-fetched, seemed unlikely, it seemed unreasonable. And now here we are in the fall of 2011, and much has happened since that time. And much of what I predicted has come to pass. And what I want to say today is, much of what I predicted has still not yet transpired. But it will. This isn't over. The collapse that began in 2007 is still continuing. It's been arrested. It's been delayed slightly. Ben Bernanke believed he could reverse that contraction. His mentor, Milton Friedman from the University of Chicago, taught Bernanke well. Unfortunately, he taught him the wrong stuff. Bernanke felt that by following Friedman's prescription, they had the keys to reversing another contraction such as what happened in the 1930s. In fact, at Milton Friedman's 90th birthday party in 2001, Ben Bernanke got up and he said, I want to apologize for central bankers, for the Federal Reserve, because you were right and we were wrong. We caused the Great Depression. And but because of you, we can prevent it from happening again. Such was his certainty. Such was his hubris. Such was his his, I don't even want to talk about it. It's, 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 he, he was so sure that what he could do could reverse what happened. In 2006, Alan Greenspan gave the reins of the Federal Reserve over to his successor, Ben Bernanke. In 2007, Ben Bernanke was at the helm when in August 2007, an unexpected credit contraction hit the global markets. It took a year for that contraction to spread to Wall Street. It took down Lehman Brothers. The Lartan took down AIG, the largest insurance company in the world, and would have taken down the world's financial system in a cataclysm that has not been seen since the Great Depression. But it didn't, because governments came and rescued the banks that time. They rescued them, because they knew what had happened in the 1930s could happen again unless they rescued them again. What they thought was, their rescue would work. They thought was, okay, we rescued the banks, we're going to reliquify them, we're going to pump them up, we're going to step in, we're going to expand the money supply, and we're going to be able to surmount what happened to us, which we couldn't do in the 1930s because we didn't know enough. But now, with hindsight and with history at our back, and with the teachings of Milton Friedman to go by, we've got the playbook that is going to help us survive what happened to us in the 1930s and brought the entire world economy to a halt. Well, I studied the Great Depression too. But unlike Ben Bernanke, Milton Friedman wasn't my mentor. Unlike Ben Bernanke, I didn't study at the University of Chicago, taught by august economists. I just sat there and wondered what had happened in the 1930s. Why did it happen? And could it happen again? And by the end of the 1990s, I knew it could. When the dot-com double burst in, 19, in 2000, I knew it was a replay of the 1929 crash, and I knew we were headed off for the races. And when, when, Milton, when, when and Alan Greenspan first tried to stop the contraction, by reflating another bubble, the U.S. real estate bubble, by slashing interest rates down to 1%, by letting clerks at your local Circle K buy a half a million dollar house, when, bank, when you could walk into a bank and buy whatever house you want, and the banker, I mean, <laughs> the closest thing to it was, don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> you know? I mean, if he didn't ask you how much money you made, and you didn't volunteer him that you were making 11 25 an hour, he would let you sign for a loan, a mortgage of a half a million dollars. Now these are bankers, all right? Did they take leave of their senses? These people who would look at you before with an with a eye that's so, so disparaging of your financial situation that you were afraid that <coughs> they would know that you had somehow lied about how much you made when you're 12 years old? These are the same people that in 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, you could walk into a bank preferably countrywide because they were giving it away there, shoveling it out the door. You could walk in and buy any house you wanted. All right? These are the same people that did that. Now, did they take leave of their senses? Did all of a sudden these usually tight-fisted, thin-lipped bankers 
become generous of heart? I mean, after they gave you your three-quarter million dollar loan, did they go home and put $10 in the, in the begging bowl of a homeless man on the way home? I mean, is this what had happened? Did all of a sudden these fiscal conservatives become the million points of light that Reagan thought they were going to become? No, let me assure you they didn't. They did this for one reason. When that, that dot-com bubble burst in the year 2000, they knew that unless they reflated and poured more credit down the gullet of America, we would soon expire, just like we had in the 1930s. So they did. They slashed interest rates down to 1%. They made the unaffordable housing affordable. They gave it to you whether you could afford it or not. And you took that money and you went and spent it. You fixed up your, you had a granite counter put in where your linoleum counter was sort of aging. All right? You went to your living room and that, you know, that, uh, that rug that you had put in 15 years ago all of a sudden looked like it was fraying. All right? And if you hadn't spent money on your house before, now that you found out your house was worth 40% more, you went down and refinanced it and took that trip that you and your wife always wanted. That honeymoon to Paris, that around the world, that's what you did. Now, why? This was all done on borrowed money. Because I want to tell you, what the bankers do is they live on your borrowing. They live on your borrowing. What they never figured out is they were going to die when you couldn't pay it back. And now this is where they're at. Those houses that most Americans bought, they can't pay for anymore. They're thinking of walking away from them. Those refis are out there. And what happened is, what happened was that Alan Greenspan's bubble did not save the world and specifically the United States from what was going to happen. It gave it four more years though. Four more years. It's like all of a sudden the moribund, fatally hit economy was given four more years by massive injections of steroids. All right? Now what they didn't count on was what four years of steroids would do to the economy. They only knew if they didn't put the economy on life support, it would die. So they put it and they got a huge sailing bag of borrowed money. Stuck it up, crammed it in the arm of America, and it went in and it went in and pretty soon, my God, the Americans got off that gurney, started walking down the hallway in the hospital, and in 2006, life was good. Life was good, my friends. The next year, I gave my talk at the Positive Deviant Network and told them what was going to happen. Told them what was going to happen, and they didn't believe it. Well, it did. And now, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen next. We're in 2011, all right? Alan Greenspan's out of the way, you know, like the maestro of the markets is, well, you know, he's like, you know, nobody sort of listens to him anymore. When they do, it's sort of a grain of salt, all right? But who he listened to is Ben Bernanke with the same desperate hope that cancers on a patient ward, hope that the radiologist is telling them the truth. Hoping that their doctors are going to be able to save them. All right? With that same desperate hope. Well, why I want to tell you, there's a difference between the doctors and the economists. The economists who are telling you that they can save you are in there hoping that you can live only to pay off your loans. They're not there to help you. They're there to help save a system by which is given governments and power the ability to live beyond their means on the basis of your borrowing. They're not going to save you for you. They're trying to save themselves. And this is something people don't realize. This is something they turn to their governments and they think, why aren't our governments saving us? I want to tell you the truth here. Your governments have no intention of saving you. Your governments are trying to save themselves. And once you understand that basic fundamental truth, your worlds may get a lot more clear and a lot more simpler. Republicans are wondering, why did they do this? Why did they spend all that money? These were fiscal conservatives, people who thought you should have a balanced budget. These were people who voted Ronald Reagan in power in, in, in 1980 because he said he would balance the budget. He would, this was important to fiscal conservatives. But I want to tell you something. At the end of Reagan's term, he had borrowed three and a half trillion dollars. He had increased indebtedness in the United States over three times what it had been when he got in. And you guys didn't care. You guys didn't go, you lied to us, Ronald. We voted you in to balance the budget. You lied to us. Instead, you spent it all in the military. But you had money coursing through your veins and you didn't care. Because you were living better than you were when he took office. And that's all you knew. All right? So you Republicans didn't care enough to remember about balanced budgets. And then there's the Democrats. 
You voted Bill Clinton in. Oh, thank God Bill Clinton came in. Thank God he ended all those awful years of Ronald Reagan and then George Bush. He's our savior. He, this man's going to save us. He tells me he speaks the truth. He's got love in his heart. He talks about the unfortunate. He talks about the, the downtrodden. He's, he's not like Reagan who talked about, we got to pull up ourselves by the bootstraps and all he did was pull up the rich. No, this man cares about us. So you voted Bill in. He told you exactly what you wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. And in 1996, what Bill Clinton did is he uh, signed the uh, Communication Consolidation Act, or whatever they called it, allowing Fox News to become a network in the United States. Mm -hmm. All right? The, you know the Fox News Roger, run by Roger Ailey's Nixon, the old hatchet man? The one that just gives you ulcers? The one that lies to the American public with no compunction? The one that brought the United States into the Iraq War? The, one, the, the network that can't even get into Canada because they got something about when networks lie, you can't do it. All right? But here in the United States, it's one of the most biggest networks, and it was brought in when Bill Clinton signed that little thing that allowed them to do it. Bill did this to you. Oh, but you didn't care, did you, Democrats? You love what Bill said. You cared about it because you knew he cared about you. All right? And in 1999, when Bill Clinton let the Wall Street into the U.S. Treasury, into it, by repealing the Glass-Steagall Act that had put, been put in place in 1933 at the depth of the Great Depression to keep another depression from happening. He signed it into law. But you didn't care about it, Democrats, did you? Oh, no. Bill told me, he told me the things I wanted to hear, just like you Republicans didn't care about what, what Reagan did because he told you the things that he, he, you wanted to hear. Don't you realize these people are put there to tell you what you want to hear? They're put there by the people who want to tell you, who want them to tell you what you want to hear so they can be elected and do what they pay them to do? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, when you go in that voting booth, it's like going into a titty bar. <laughs> yeah? And if you think you're getting true love, go ahead. But someday, you're going to wake up. Someday it's going to dawn on you. That beautiful girl who you've been giving the, your family's food money to for the last three months doesn't even recognize you when you walk in and you smiled at her. It's going to dawn on you. And I don't know when, but I expect it's going to be soon. But what I expect it will be, it will be too late to save the U.S. economy. But it may not be too late to save America. And that is my hope. That is my hope. Voter dissatisfaction with their political parties is at an all-time high. And it's for a reason. Because it's starting to dawn on the electorate, on Americans, that pulling that thing or punching that hole is not going to get you what you want. It may be the closest thing that you thought was going to get you what you want. But it was like giving your little kid a toy to pacify him while you're going to take him and do whatever you're going to do anyway. Because you knew the kid would cry. He'd throw a fit if you knew you weren't going to the movie that afternoon. All right? So you did what you had to do. So they find people to tell the little kid, oh, it's all right. You know, and the ones, the conservatives, they like to be rocked a certain way. You know, they like to be told what conservatives like to be told. And they'll tell you that. Oh, we're going to balance the budget, you know. We want smaller government. We want to... You know, they'll tell you that. And on the other side, you know, the liberals, they want to be told different things. Oh, we're going to take care of you. We're going to care. We're going to get out of Iraq. We're not going to have a police state. You know, and this is what happens. And you guys go to sleep. But you wake up four years later because you know it's gone to... It's gone to hell in a handbasket again. And you start screaming. You start screaming. You won't even listen to the last person because he's lied to you. So they bring somebody else out to lie to you. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And this is what's happened. Well, we're getting to the end of the line. And we're waking up. And this is our chance. And I'm not saying it's going to happen the next election. But it could. But it's going to happen at one of these times. All right? And it's going to happen because you're going to wake up and realize that you've been played. That all they wanted was your vote. They wanted your vote because without your vote, they couldn't do what they wanted to do. And your vote is so important to them that they pay millions of dollars to that man who's talking to you. Whether he's a Democrat or a Republican, they pay millions to get that man to convince you that he's going to do what you want him to do. And when that man gets elected, 
He knows you gave him one vote, and he knows who gave him the millions of dollars it took for him to get your vote. Now, here we are, 2011. Ben Bernanke's had his crack at the wheel. He slowed down the financial collapse. I will give him that much. He has. If he hadn't bailed out Wall Street, if they hadn't done that, your banks would have been closed, you'd have no money, and you'd have been on the street. So he delayed it by three years. But what he did do is he further indebted the country. This great country of ours is now staggering on a massive amount of debt that it can't repay. But it couldn't repay it even four years ago. So maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe they've lowered the amount of, of steroids in your body beyond a certain point. But the way they figure it is that they're waiting for a miracle. They don't know. They're just trying to suck as much money out of this dying beast until it falls over. And they figure when it does fall over, they'll have more money than the rest of us. So whatever happens, they're going to be able to do better than everybody else. That's just simply put. They don't think we're going to recover. They're going to tell you you're going to recover because they know if they walked into the hospital room and said, hey, listen, you know, save what you got left for the kids. You know, the insurance company is going to take it all and the hospital. They're not going to tell you that because they represent the insurance company. They represent the hospital and they represent the doctors. All right. But they're in that room because they've got you convinced that they represent you. All right. And in a way, they are charged with taking care of you. But they're taking care of you in a way that you don't quite realize. Because in the goodness of your heart, in the belief that, in the desperate belief that you haven't been abandoned, that these people who you've followed, who you've believed, who you've read about, who you've argued with your neighbors and kids and parents, that no, no, they are going to save us. These people have our, 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 our interests at heart because they've told you what you wanted to hear. Do you know how easy it is to tell someone what they want to hear? When a man comes home from his girlfriend's house, he knows when he walks in that house, he should say, hi, dear, what's for dinner? I love you. Well, same things happen to you. And I haven't broken your bubble. Your bubble broke a long time ago. I'm just telling you, this is what's happening. And I hope with every ounce of my being that you wake up and you wake up soon enough to understand the trouble you're in, how you got here, and why doing what you've done in the past is not going to get you out of it. What you're going to have to do is to find your own way to the truth. And it's there. It's there. That's why I knew in 2007 it was not what they were telling us it was true. I made my way there. You can make your way there too. The truth is there. You just have to want it more than accepting what you've been told by those who you've been desperately hoping were going to save you. They're saving themselves. They're not saving you. They're telling you they're going to save you, but that's how they're saving themselves. And that's really where we are, folks, in 2011. They didn't like in that room at the Positive Evening Network what I told them in March. But some have come around a few years later, and they all know whether they believe me then or now, is that what I did say was true. And now what I'm telling you today about the political system about the powers that be, it's, it's, it's the same thing. I know these are uncomfortable truths. They were uncomfortable to the folks in that room in 2007 when I said, if you want to save your assets, sell your house, sell your stocks, and buy gold. And I knew almost nobody did it. But we're four years closer towards what that crisis is going to produce. And that crisis is going to produce great change. And it's just not financial change. It's going to produce changes at a human level. The richer we got as a nation, the less we cared about each other. I don't know if you noticed it, but I did. I watched what happened to this country. The apparently more powerful that it got, the richer that it got, it began to pat itself on the back when it did nothing to deserve it. And it thought itself better than the rest of the world. We're going to find out that's not true. We're going to find out we are all one. And we ha we're going to find out we had better start caring about those we haven't cared about in the past.